everyone and welcome to Bad Chat, the multi-award winning first therapeutic radiographer-led oncology podcast. Welcome to podcast number 109. My name is Jay McNamara and I'm joined by fellow host Namanjaka Anderson. Hi everyone. So a big thank you to our last guest, Nina Lopez, who will be discussing her stage four cancer um, and living with um, a long set of cancer trials that she's been experiencing. If you haven't had a chance yet, please do go and take a listen. So we're really pleased to introduce our guest this evening, CK. We've been watching you on the podcast for ages. I think it's got to be over a year now. <laughs> Thank you. I'm grateful to be here. We have been navigating, but I feel it's the divine timing with everything that's been going on the past week. So the timing is perfect. I know. Everything happens for a reason, doesn't it? I'm a firm believer of that. So, yeah, thank you so much for joining us. We really, really appreciate it. And I, I feel like our global success of Rad Chat is going to be escalated because you are world-renowned yourself because you're currently kind of doing this from New York. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we're, we're internationally now here. Yeah, I'm in New York at the moment, which I'm blessed and grateful for. And this is the, the great accessibility of online podcasts and social media. We can extend our reach and our communication and connectivity. So I'm grateful to be here today. No, oh, well, thank you so much. So, CK, do you want to introduce yourself and tell the audience a little bit about yourself? Yeah, hey everyone. So I'm CK and my pronouns are they, them. I let's say I'm a multifaceted being. I have many interests within education, art, healthcare, <laughs> and creativity. Uh, I qualified as a diagnostic radiographer and I still I am a diagnostic radiographer, but I also uh, speak and write on gender and sexuality and intersectional inclusion. And I write poetry and I teach yoga. So I amalgamate uh, healthcare. Um, and holistic health and creativity and education and yeah explore, explore as much as I can in life and remain open to the wonder and awe and yeah just I, I feel it's important for me to expand in my creativity as much as it is in my day-to-day -day, uh, career as well. TK with so many interests and facets what drew you to be a diagnostic radiographer because it, it doesn't seem like the natural pathway when you are so creative and you are so artistic? I guess a good question. So I, when I was leaving school, I studied, uh, I studied a few topics that really related into allopathic medicine and I wanted to be of service and I wanted to do a, a vocational degree. And I did a, some placements. I did many placements so before I made my decision on, on different intersections of work but uh, I, I worked at a kids hospital and I really enjoyed it and I thought okay this is what I'll start out doing and see where I go but my creativity was always there but in them days it was you know it was you need to go and get a real job <laughs> so I went and got a real job but um, you know I, I'm really grateful that I've made my way back to my creativity and I feel it's been very healing and deeply important to me to be able to um, embrace and expand within within my creativity as well. So you mentioned, obviously, with everything going on recently, what did you mean? Uh, so within trans and gender inclusion, within healthcare, uh, as I, I said, as we said, I'm, I'm in New York and I had a few friends reach out and describe their feelings and emotions on what was going on and reach out to see who I was as well. And then I had some friends that just like, don't look at the media till you get back to London, you know. Um, yeah, I, I feel there's a lot going on at the moment. There's, I, I feel there's a huge destabilization of many structures of society. And I feel that there's a lot of deflection and distraction going on in one way, in one intersection of of humanity that is being really affected with this is, is trans people because it's, it's easy to deflect into the destabilization of gender or the inclusion of gender um, life beyond the binary you know what is it like to live an expansive life within a gender that you choose uh, not the gender that you not the sex that you're assigned and yeah there's a monopolization I feel a politicization of, of trans people uh, with it by the government and the media and it's 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 creating moral panic and i feel that healthcare is so important we all have a legal right to inclusive healthcare 
and it's detrimental and could be fatal for people to perhaps not show up to appointments, not want to be seen within the healthcare system, be of fear of how they're going to be perceived, how they're going to be treated. And I feel it's important that we acknowledge that patient care is comes first and foremost. It's, it's vital for, for every single person that steps into a hospital door. And I feel it's important to remember that there has been no complaints against any trans women or trans people that, that have been patients within the hospital um, you know, institution. It is an institution. But there have been complaints by trans people, non-binary people, gender non-conforming people, uh, including myself, who have been um, treated in healthcare and maybe haven't received inclusive healthcare as they, they rightly deserve, as we rightly deserve. And I feel that's really important to note because there, when this distraction and deflection, it's, you know, moral panic, there's, there's no uh, evidence to back it up. And, you know, I feel that if people are listening to the media and the government, they need to be reassured that they will be taken care of within the healthcare setting. And that there has been a lot done within inclusion practices in healthcare. And they, that'll continue to happen, you know, teams, healthcare teams, that do value their practice and their patient care will continue to be inclusive, continue to give people the best support and health care that they can, regardless of what the government and the media are saying. CK, you have a huge responsibility, I would imagine, with with being visible on social media. Um, how does that affect your day-to-day -day life with kind of having that responsibility? Thank you. Well, I... I've, last year, I did a lot of a lot of activism in in, in the public eye and act, activism on the streets, particularly within the uh, the drag the drag shows. You know the the lack of awareness around the inclusivity of drag shows and trying to cancel can, this kind of cancelling trans people, non-binary people. Uh, healthcare again was talked about. Um, and I, I felt I got burnt out, you know, I put a lot of a lot of energy into it and at times there was a lot of, of you know, talking and not, not being heard. And from then I decided to channel my energy into creativity and educating, which I continue to do. But activism for me has, has you know, allowed me to, to really come together with the community as well. And I feel it's, it's important, but I do understand that not everyone has the capacity and not everyone has the capacity all the time to be involved in activism. And it is important that we look after ourselves first because we can't pour from an empty cup. And activism doesn't always enable us to be heard, you know, um, within what we are saying. Uh, but it's it's important to show up and to be a part of, I feel, in whatever capacity we can and whatever capacity is uh, suitable for each of us individually. So I do, I, I'm grateful I have a therapy and I have a very uh, close community and I feel very supported in the work and education that I do, uh, both you know in, in healthcare and in education and creativity and in holistic health as well. Um, but I've had to cultivate that over time and I've had to be honest about how I feel as well uh, to be and allow that, my vulnerability to allow me to receive help and support when I need it as well. CK, I just want to say thank you for explaining how what you did about the government and the state of affairs. I think if I'd asked that question to somebody else in a pub, I'd get a very hurtful, hateful response. I think I've had experiences recently with people who I thought were quite respectable, but when it came to anything to do with the trans population, trans health, anything, it was very, very inflammatory and ragey. I think ragey is the only word I can really find to talk about it like that. I just, for me, it doesn't really make sense because exactly as you said, the NHS is built for everyone. That's the whole point and the ethos of what we do. Uh, healthcare, whether you can afford it or not, it's still for everyone. Um, it, it's just strange that it's now become this. I suppose so soon to the general election and things like that coming up here in the UK. Yes, thank you, Norman. I, I, I believe that there is a fear of not understanding. You know, I, I feel we all have limitations as humans within our capacity for understanding. And there's lots of things that I don't understand, but I accept. And I feel moving into a place of acceptance of everyone's lived experience, no one can deny anyone's lived experiences. You know, it's it's just not it's not justified, and I feel the anger and rage is a deflection of the real problems, the real issues going on within healthcare, the real issues going on within society, 
and as I say, this destabilization of many structures and parts of society that instead of looking at the real problem, it's like, let's, let's look over here. And I feel the rage and upsetness and frustration and, and concern from the trans community and their allies and their family and friends is, is completely justified. And it's how we now channel that into, into looking after ourselves and, and allowing ourselves to be seen and heard and to, to make the changes that we can. But I, it all begins with each and every person every single person can 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 step up and step in if they, if they choose to do so. TK, you mentioned that you'd had kind of prejudice when you've had healthcare. Can you expand a little bit on that? I'm just like from my perspective it it's it gets me really angry that people have that experience. But I also think sharing it might help people realize actually the true impact of people not necessarily being inclusive facilities not being inclusive the environment not being inclusive i don't necessarily pe think people really realize the impact it has on people's life mental health their families yeah thank you joe i last uh, two years ago i um presented in in a &E, I had uh, carbon monoxide exposure uh, symptoms and I went into a &E in a central London hospital and I spoke to the reception and I said I'm going to be on the system as my birth name but this is my name and she was very very helpful the uh, secretary and said oh I think I can change this and I said okay I said just to let you know this is what I'd like to be this is my name and this is what I'd like to be called please do not call out my birth name in the uh, waiting area it was, a, it was a packed any waiting area and she said okay I'll change it so she changed what she thought she changed and gave me a wristband so the wristband matched my name and I took a seat and then I was triaged and as I was triaged they called out my birth name and I, I stood up and I said I've spoke to reception I said I'm trans I said I've, I've asked that um, I'd be called by my name my pronouns are they them and the nurse said oh I can't do anything and I said I said I, th I think you can I said there must be something on the system I said because on the system they have a note section or a section we can just put a note and make people aware or flag it and he said no no I can't these computers aren't talking to each other and I said and then I, I did pull the medical professional card and I said well, I am also a medical professional I'm aware that there are ways of doing this I said there should be a preferred pronouns tab there should be a, a, a name tab he said, oh, we don't have that, but I'll just, I'll just put it here. And I said, okay. And I was feeling frustrated and I, 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 because this hospital also has a gender clinic at the hospital and I just was frustrated. How can you not get it right at the front door of an A&E department? And as COVID was still, uh, there were still restrictions for COVID, my friend was sitting, out, sitting outside and I texted them and I said, you know, I, I have this experience, but I said, I'm worthy of being here and I know I'm worthy of being here. And when they, I looked up and there was kind of whispering going on between the staff and then a doctor came out and he, yeah, he wasn't very welcoming. He didn't give me any eye contact. He, I don't know if he was having a bad day, but the patient care was less than desirable and throughout the whole pr process of for me getting from, from reception right into being seen. Well, to be to be seen to a point and then um, having a discussion with him and um yeah, I, I just, I felt very, very frustrated about it. And I was also very aware that, thankfully, I had enough awareness of myself to, to stay. You know, I knew I needed to stay. But if it had been someone perhaps younger, someone perhaps who was in a very, very, very bad way, someone who didn't have a friend sitting outside, they may not have stayed and it could have proven fatal. So I did um, report it to PALS and the, the patient liaison team and someone got back to me and it, it was... It was and still is being dealt with, but I, I reported and they, they met up with me and we had a conversation. It was it was very quick how they got back to me, but I felt that they really needed to be aware and they said they were working on changing their systems. But I feel that many places are seen to be doing, but not actually always, always doing. And I feel that's something that needs to be worked on. And, you know, it really, really needs to be, you know, priority within healthcare. It needs to be a priority within healthcare because we are dealing with people's lives. 
This is also represented in cancer diagnosis. So we've had Stuart on, uh, it's now called Outpatients, who also lived through this, uh, the charity. Um, but even just, yeah, just, just the different statistics around knowing who's in front of you and then knowing how, how their gender or their sex will affect what type of cancer they'll get. This is also something I think with all this anger, people might be starting to forget that this is another element or another layer to it that we do have to start considering. And this isn't really the problem. The problem would be cancer. That's what we're trying to tackle. It doesn't really matter. And cancer doesn't discriminate anyway. It'll, it'll go wherever it needs to and wants to. But yeah, from, from a cancer diagnosis perspective, it's also, I suppose, worrying with the state of affairs, what could happen in the future. Yeah, thank you, Nima, for acknowledging that. I feel um, I have been, I've been advocating for Movember for trans rights for a few years now, and I feel that illnesses are very generalised. You know, breast cancer, pink, prostate cancer, blue, cervical cancer, and that's just to name a few. But I feel that even even the brochures. You know, uh, my dad was diagnosed with prostate cancer, and when I was going with him for his treatment. You know, the brochure, brochures were saying it's a man's thing and all of the posters were, were male and there are trans females at risk of and are getting treated for, for prostate cancer. Even gay men are given incorrect information on the uh, how they, their treatment and, and also they are being perceived as being street men. Some, some have reported back, doctors have said, you know, you can bring your wife to the next appointment or you can, you know, you can... You can have you can have you can have sex in an X amount of time, but it's different. It's actually different for gay men. So they're given incorrect information because they're not able to perhaps feel like they can actually address this because they are addressing cancer and its treat its treatment for cancer. So it needs to be acknowledged. I feel there needs to be more inclusivity within the, the uh, posters within within not in illnesses beyond the binary basically you know and and what does that look like and anyone is at risk of breast cancer people with a prostate are at risk of prostate cancer and people with the cervix are at risk of cervical cancer how important is allyship the awareness of what allyship should be exactly as you said some people are doing something some people aren't doing as much as they probably could be at the moment yeah i feel it's it's been aware of what what is what is right and just and also how we feel how much we feel we can tolerate as a, as, as a community for humanity as well and allyship within you know allyship can be reading a book it can be picking up the phone and checking in on you know, tra the trans community or lgbtqi plus community it can be going to protests it can be educating ourselves it can be making the changes um, it can be adding, and as a suggestion, it can be adding pronouns to the bottom of your, your email footer or, um, you know, when you're on a Zoom call or you're on a meeting. It can be adding, um, just uh, letting people know that you're aware, you're aware of what's going on. And um, again, it can be easy to bury your hand, their heads in the soil with everything that's going on, but this is a time when we really need allies to, to step up and to acknowledge that this isn't right, this isn't fair, this isn't equal, and people's lives are at risk. And, and you know, the rate of, of suicide, the rate of, of maybe death by illnesses that people do want to go and get checked out for uh, are on the rise, as well as hate crime is on the rise as well. And this is a time now that people really need to want to step up and want to be, make change, but also know the capacity for that, know their own capacity for that. CK, how can we as healthcare professionals do better? What would you love to see from not necessarily the NHS as a whole, but I'm just thinking if you have healthcare professionals listening, what would you love that they take away from this podcast and start to implement straight away to make a real difference and a real change straight away rather than having to rely on bureaucracy of other people? I feel as, as you know... Be open to the human experience and be open to any everyone's individual human experience and see people as they are not who you think they are you know if a, when a patient presents this is a human 
then let them explain their name, let them explain their pronouns, not even explain, let them tell you their name, let them tell you their pronouns, let them tell you perhaps what changing room they'd like to go into, let them tell you how the experience that they're going through and, and allow yourself to listen and to hear and to see the person for who they are. And I feel that creates an openness, that creates a trust, and, and that trust then will be built over time, especially for patients that are coming back, especially for, for cancer treatment. They'll be coming back, they'll be seeing the same friendly faces, the same team, and they'll know that they are being supported. And I, I really urge healthcare staff at the moment, you know, to please, you know, keep on creating inclusive spaces, whether it be, you know, inclusive changing rooms, toilets, facilities, um, you know, making sure that you're the posters and the brochures as much as they can, they are inclusive as well. If you're open to wearing badges and lanyards, and these suggestions, just because someone is, isn't wearing a badge or a lanyard, I know that does not mean that they're they're not an ally. It's just they may not be wearing a badge or a lanyard that particular day. But also, just creating and cultivating an inclusive space, and and I and I feel it's really important at the moment within the um, Irma regulations as well. They have uh, we we've been making implementations for inclusive pregnancy. So women and people of childbearing potential uh, that are exposed to, to radiation, I feel that's really important too. Uh, so when people are presenting, they're given an opportunity to say, yes or no, I am I'm not pregnant. And they're not just boxed into a gender and then asked that question on the basis of someone's decision that they've made about them. CK, you've mentioned a few different examples of healthcare. Do you have an example of a positive experience? I have to say my team, you know, I have to say one of the teams that I work with in a in a kids' hospital. I feel very supported in the t- in the team, and I also have had difficulties with certain teams, but in, in this team, I feel particularly, um, yeah, seen and heard. And, and you know, it's important that I, you know, I'm aware of my lived experience, and that's uh, you know, I have that I have freedom within, thankfully, and I'm, I feel very blessed for that. But I feel. It is. It it just puts a little, a little smile on my face that that people are people have, do have our backs, and it's important to remember that, especially with everything that's going on at the moment. You know, we're not alone in this, and we do have people that do actually care. And it has been very heartwarming on social media when I was on X a couple of days ago. People where the patients were putting their positive experiences of healthcare, trans people that had positive experiences of healthcare. And and that and some of those were from Thursday night, you know. Some of them like literally were the night before, you know. And then there were healthcare staff, managers of healthcare staff, teams of healthcare, paramedics, you know, openly saying, "We will take care of you. You are welcome here, and you know, we we will do our best with our patient care and the services that we provide for you." And I feel it's very important to remember because this this creation creation of moral panic by the government is not reflective of all healthcare institutions and the NHS. It's not reflective. Can I ask a professional question as well? How did you go from being a paediatric radiographer to working at the Nightingale Hospital? Because <laughs> that's, that's like a real switch up, isn't it? <laughs> it is. It is. So I was, in, I was in another hospital at the time and uh, an opportunity came through for me to go to the Nightingale. And I, and I do... Yeah, I, I really enjoy being of service. I really enjoy being of, being of service, and I, I, I feel that that's what I'm here to, to embrace in my lifetime in, in whatever capacity I, that is. And uh, when the opportunity came up, I said, yeah, let's go for it. Let's, let's um, be a part of it in this team. And I have to say I'm grateful I made that decision because it was the first place I'd ever worked where everyone wanted to be there. Everyone wanted to be a part of Everyone wanted to help out. Everyone wanted to, to be of service in the way that they, they could be to humanity at a very, very, very challenging, difficult, stressful time. Uh, so it was a real coming together of community within that hospital and even for the short period that it was. But yeah, I do, I do enjoy adult medicine as well and, and, tra- and trauma, but I've, I've done that so I feel, yeah, I just enjoy kids more at the moment. Outside of work, have I, is this true that you do some modelling? Joe's just texted me. Can you tell us a bit more about this? I, this is amazing. It's like another another part of your identity. Yeah, I just, you know, I feel that I just, I'm grateful I just got to add many strings to my bow. Yeah, I've, I've done and do, I do modelling and I do speaking and writing and 
Um, I've, I've had lots of fun at the London Career Fashion Show, which I've really, really enjoyed being a part of uh, the past few years. Um, and yeah, I just... I just Can I ask then, why were the Nightingale Hospitals so ugly to look at if you were working <laughs> there? You could have spiced fashion. it up. <laughs> did, did you not put that on your cv then <laughs> i know we know we could have brought some color there too i feel yeah i i brought my um i do love combining holistic health and holistic medicine allopathic medicine i feel it's very 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 important and uh, i was able to to teach some yoga in there as well to staff in in between ships and, and on our breaks which i really enjoyed too and two and her uh played some sound bows and singing bows um and yeah, I, I, I feel it all webs together. It's very interesting, though, as I reflect back on, on, on everything that I'm a part of. It does, actually, it's, it's like spinning a web, you know, everything, you know, bringing uh, inclusion into healthcare, allowing for inclusion within holistic practices, too, because not all holistic spaces are inclusive or open to being inclusive. And, you know, there's some places that have I've had a little way to go yet, but... I feel by showing up every day, each and every one of us do our part, you know, showing up in, in who we are and what our beliefs and our values are, that, that is essentially us doing our part. Can I ask you a deep question following on from the modelling? I feel like Jo's had her deep questions, it's my turn. Um, you're obviously very open about who you are, your personality. Has that taken a lot of time to get to this point of feeling confident? I'm just thinking of anybody else listening who might not be at the same point as you are and be able to express themselves. Obviously, I see modelling as putting yourself out there. Someone is telling you what to wear, how to pose, what to do, and you're the object. But that's still a huge beacon of hope for a lot of people. But how? I mean, I'm not saying everyone needs to be a model, but how do people get to that point of almost body confidence and being like, well, actually, no, this is, my, this is me, this is my personality. This is where how I identify and how I get here. Yeah, thank you, Naman. I, I do believe it's it's all an inside job. It's all an inside job. But like whilst I have I have fun do you know doing the do I had fun doing the modelling and, and working on set and met some amazing people, I feel it's all an inside job and I feel that yeah, through experiences in life and being able to reflect on my life experiences and I'm in therapy too. I'm very grateful to be in psychotherapy and uh you know, I've moved through grief in my life, I've moved through some experiences, I, I got time and was able to, I was able to reflect got time I was able to reflect on those experiences and and over time reflect on who I am and and it's an ongoing job I think it's a not it's an on it's an ongoing process and my spiritual practices such as meditation and yoga uh, have, have been valuable for me with that as well and I am grateful I'm able to give back and give people the time that, that I was so freely given during uh, you know, moving through a process of grief at one time in my life and and I feel that I, I've been able to really just amalgamate my own experience and then be aware of how I can give back to others through my own experience too and and recognize that we're all uh, I know it's it is very it's it's very spiritual but we are all one you know we are all one and I feel that that's for this you know the the uh, the physical and the politicization of everything that's not the moment like there is our, our soul and our spirit within and, and we really are able to focus and be with ourselves and our soul and our spirit through the through our unfolding and our actualization of ourselves with our own work and our inner processes and, and really learning how we respond and, and, and how we feel and what our values are and then we can you know bring ourselves out into the world and, and, and create and cultivate community and, and and be of service and I've, it has it's been it's been a path it still is a path and I'm grateful I've got to know myself and I'm still I'm still getting to know myself you know um I'm definitely definitely I would not say that I, I'll ever be there but I'm doing the best I can and when someone asks me you know what do you do but I, that question is so broad for me I say I do my best you know I do because that's I do my best you know and they'll say oh <laughs> so yeah that's all I can do <laughs> I love that. I absolutely love that. Scrap, scrap having a portfolio career, just doing your best. I love it. Absolutely love it. Yeah. Because I feel sometimes, you know, in, in society, it's, it, there's, a, there's a judgment, especially within boxes. If you think of boxes and putting people in boxes, there is a judgment on how much respect to give someone on the basis of what they do, not who they are. 
you know, so what does that person do? Oh, that person's X, Y, Z. Oh, the respect for them has gone up. You know, that person is this, but it's not. It's it's who they are, not what who we are, not what we do. You know, and I feel it's very important to remember. Um, and especially, especially, you take that back into the experience, the lived experience of trans people. Like, who is this person in front of me? Not not what do I think they are? You know. My grandma would disagree on the, like, the who you are as status. In India, you get every Sunday a matrimonial page in newspapers, and it will have adverts for human beings to get married off. So, <laughs> is a doctor who'll be at the higher up, or engineer will be slightly higher up. <laughs> but there's still, still that. <laughs> I can see Joe's face on camera being like, what? But this is normal. This, this is how... Yeah, like, or in India being more fair-skinned, you're likely to get a better husband, wife, partner, same as a better job, what car you've got, but that it can be quite material in that sort of way. Yeah, and I feel that's, you know, if, if society keeps going like that, it kind of, it kind of, that feeds into the, the patriarchy as well, isn't it? It keeps going within that, that power play of, you know, what, what people are doing and, and power and, domination and uh you know control and it's it's a, it's a very dangerous way to go and i feel that's that's the sad reality if people are looking outwards all the time and wanting more and more and more instead of actually stopping and looking inwards and looking at ourselves and it's a uh, yeah it's, it's a very dangerous game and I'm, it's and I'm, i've you know it's it's sad that certain communities in, around the world are being pulled into this you know um in, in many ways, oppressed communities are being, are being pulled into this power play and this is something that we, we definitely need to be aware of and do what we can to, to raise awareness of yeah, these structures that aren't working, that aren't working, that need to be dismantled or in, in whatever way it looks like. I feel we're in a huge rupture in society at the moment and the repair will come whenever that may be, but the, you know, it might not be in our lifetime, who knows, it might not be in our lifetime, but we're in a huge rupture at the moment and it's important we look after ourselves and each other within that. What's next for you then? I feel like you can't add any more hats on, but... <laughs> There's plenty more. Plenty well, more CK, I'm going to write a book, I think. I feel a book coming, CK. Have you written a book before? Really cute. Not yet, not yet. I do write poetry and I, I, I do spoken word poetry and that's really helped me within my education and creativity too because I'm able to speak to, to audiences regarding my own experiences and, and my collective experience too. So yeah, I feel like that book is potentially on the cards. And I and I just I just you know, I feel just being open to the mystery of life and seeing what, what comes next. But I do I do feel I'm here for more and I feel that, that I'm I'm open to that and I just have to take it day by day. You're so inspiring. I feel like I feel like after talking to you, CK, I need to change my life. I need to kind of, yeah, I need to not just work and think about actually what do I really get joy from? Rad chat. Yeah, but this is the episode. It's exactly, and, and you know, these yeah societal constructs like we do. We you know, money is an energy. We need to have a way of, of getting money. But there is there is a lot more to life than our than our nine the nine to five the nine to five. And as you say, what brings you joy? What is life giving? You know what what would you like to give your time to? You know, I'm sure playfulness with your with your kid brings that out as well. You know, but I, I it's just when you take when we start living beyond these boxes or expectations or constructs, you know, it, it just it just we just become more more free inwardly and outwardly i'm excited to see what you do joe keep me posted <laughs> dye your hair blue get a tattoo of yeah. me on your left yeah. cheek you're, you're, you're <laughs> <before> mine. <laughs> coming towards the end of the episode ck i don't know if there's anything you wanted to any last thoughts to give before you go yeah, I feel, uh, thank you both for your time today and thank you to those listening. I I feel it's important as, as, as allies and as health professionals and, and to the staff as well and to families and friends of, of staff that we really, we observe ourselves and ob observe what we can be part of, what we will tolerate, how we can make change, what we would like to 
be in support of, how would we like the future to look, and and what are we listening to that's actually real and true? You know, is it real? Is it true? And is it necessary? And and just make keep making inclusive change within healthcare systems. Keep seeing our patients for for who they are, not who we think they are, and and value everyone's own experience and and not deny anyone's experience and. You know, with with an awareness that we, when you start within our own teams, within our own organisations, and and you know, the government etc. will catch up over time. It, it's what we do within our within our immediate circles, and yeah, keep checking in with your trans, non-binary, gender non-conforming friends, family members, team teammates, and being being aware of of people's mental health and their capacity at the moment with everything that is going on. And and yeah, just loving kindness is and loving kindness is 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 the key. And I hope that we can all allow ourselves to to be loving kindness towards each and every person we come into contact with. Oh, thank you so much, CK. It's been absolutely a true pleasure to talk to you. And I'm so glad that we finally got you onto Rad Chat. So thank you so, so much. So thank you all for listening to Rad Chat. Your hosts today have been myself, Joe McNamara and Namanjelka Anderson. If you're utilising this podcast for CPD purposes, consider the reflective questions posted along with links to resources and literature that we've discussed. To receive your accredited CPD certificate, please complete the Google form linked with this podcast episode. Our next guest feature will be Lynn Buckley, who will be talking about their role as a CNS and how the hell, how they help patients with psychosexual counselling. Thank you all for listening and take care. Thank you. Oh, thank you so